All right, let's go ahead and get started. Oh, I can hear myself. Why? Oh, <laughs> so, sorry, we had some technical issues. Okay, so, um, all right, so we have a speaker today. Thank you for everybody who is here in person and all of the Zoom folks. Um, so Zoom folks, hopefully you saw it in the chat. There's a um, website. I can't hear you. Oh, no, 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 no. I don't know if you can hear us, but I mean, yeah. I can't hear anything. Huge. Okay. I can yes. hear Do Dr. Adams and maybe on your end. Yeah. Oh, Samantha, you can hear me? Okay, I can hear now. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, okay, perfect. All right, we're not sure if that happened on your end or my end or what. Okay. Um, so we do have a speaker, um, and so I am uh, going to introduce Laurel Kaminsky. Um, Laurel is the Environmental Sciences Librarian at the Marston Science Library. Um, Laurel earned her master's in biology at the University of Florida. After her master's, Laurel worked in the Florida Museum of Natural History as the project manager for digitizing the fungal collection and the butterfly and moth collection. Uh, Laura is also a lichen expert and her collected throughout Florida. Um, so she's going to be talking to us today about um, some of the stuff going on at the library. And also for those of you on Zoom before I turn this over, um, if you haven't checked in using your little eye clicker for your attendance, um, if you are registered for this seminar, um, please go ahead and do that now. And if you have questions, just let me know uh, separately. All right. Thank you for being here. Okay. Great. Thank you, Allison. This is um, really excited to be here today. And can you all hear me? The mic's a little far away, right? Okay. Um, so uh, if you haven't done so already, please go to menti.com and type in that code at the top. We're going to have some fun and make this interactive so I can learn a little bit about all of you and your research needs as we go along. So this talk, um, I'd like to just share an overview of the libraries to you because um, it's a very big sprawling system, um, hence the word ecosystem. And you know, getting data is a really huge part of your life right now be as PhD or as graduate students. Um, and so knowing Having the tools to be able to find that information as efficiently as possible might save you some stress or some heartache. And so I really want to um, say that like the library is here to really support you and to help you through your research process. And if I don't know the answer, um, my job is to help you uh, find the person who can give you the answer. Let's see. Um, so I'm going to have a lot of links today. Here's a QR code, and I can also send this to Allison afterwards. But if you want to follow along, um, well, you don't really, if you want to just have that for your own reference, you can take a photo. It's also at the end. Uh, so a little bit about myself. I am, you know, well, Mark, the libraries here at UF have what's called a liaison system. And that means that like I'm your liaison for the School of Natural Resources and the Environment. And so there's a lot of different things that I can provide as your liaison. Um, I, I'm willing, I can meet uh, with you at any point in your research process to go over or to help you through um, finding resources, what databases to use, citation management, best data practices. Um, so I'm here just as a resource um, for whatever you need. Uh, I can also come into classrooms and give lectures on uh, any part of the research process, um, how to find a database again, and also citation management. Uh, what's, a, what's a fraudulent journal? What's a peer reviewed journal? If you need help finding a really obscure article, um, I really enjoy trying to hunt down those really hard things. So send them my way. And if you would like to purchase, oh, well, if there are books that you think would benefit you or SNRE, I can take requests for books and databases and other tools or technology you think the library should have to better support um, the UF population. And then a little bit about myself. I have a really strong background in digitization and I've 
uh, collected throughout Florida. So if you want to pick my brain on places to go collecting or um, have questions on digitization workflow management, uh, please let me know. And then lastly, uh, I identify as a trans woman, and I feel it's really important to be out with that in this time. Um, and so I really uh, see a big part of my job as being an advocate for underserved communities and also and including the LGBTQIA community. Um, so if you want to, if people, as another aside, if people want to ask questions, they can do so in Zoom, but then also uh, down here in the bottom right of my screen um, is a little question button. So I will see questions pop up. So now over to you all. Um, if you're on menti.com and I would love to know what are your, what are three hashtags that describe your research? We'll get some, we'll get a good word bubble going. <laughs> Silk and genomics and moths. I, I bet that's uh, Amanda right there. <laughs> we are we used to work together. So big cat. <laughs> Lambs. Whoa, we're getting a lot of like really different ologies here and lots of different words. <laughs> so We've got a lot of water-based terms, um, some agricultural terms, uh, both aquatic and on land, genomics, plants, lots of different organisms. And I think what's really cool about this is that it really just goes to show like just how broad SNRE is. And that's one thing that's that's really cool about it. It's just the words that are bigger are ones that are said more often, but none of them are really that big yet. And so it's really cool just to see just how diverse, um, just a big, broad um, range of things that everybody here studies. And so these keywords are going to be important later on. So remember your keywords. Um, so when we think about science, we think about research and the research process. How do I conduct my experiment? Um, how do I um, do the experiment and then write it up? But I think grad school is a series of experiments. Um, it can both, you know, personally, like socially and also intellectually. And one of the big ones is finding scientific data because um, it's not very straightforward and it takes a lot of trial and error, but um, when it's all, but it's a really important skill set to learn that you can take uh, wherever you go afterwards. So if we think about a decision as a variable um, and then we want to finish as quickly as possible, we, we understand that in the context of doing an actual experiment, but there's a lot of different things that you can change about your research process that can uh, help you. And so if we're just gonna write a paper, right? We got to develop a question, keywords, and then figure out where to search, how to search, and then write it, and then in text and we're excited. Of course, there's more variables than this that go into writing, but for now, let's just play with these. And so if you think about each one um, and how to optimize each one, it'll make your life a lot smoother. And we going back to the science and ecosystems, like, you know, grad school is really hard and it's really important to find your niche. You want to find that place that you're really comfortable in um, and where you can go and find that research and you have all the things that you need to write. So maybe you can go underground and write um, or hibernate over, well, stay underground all winter. <laughs> but so finding that the libraries um, have a lot of 
um, ways to help you find your research niche um, in terms of skills. So for this presentation, uh, I've divided it up into three sections. We've got, first off, the catalog holdings at UF, and I'm going to try to use the word primo, which is what we call our UF catalog. Um, and then, so those are more like physical and resources and books, but then there's a whole lot of other services that the library provides, and that'll take us into part two. And then lastly, uh, we're gonna talk, I'm gonna show some quick feature, some features within Web of Science that I think really show how much more powerful databases are than Google Scholar. Let's first dive into catalog holdings in the Smathers library system. And so Smathers is an umbrella for six libraries here at UF, including Marston, the science library where I work. Okay, so next mentee, where do you find scientific information? Web of Science and Papers, Google Scholar, JSTOR, peer reviewed journals. So we're, yeah, let's see what happens when the screen fills up. Does it get smaller? Hmm. Well, okay, so. Um, as you can see from here, that there, that Google Scholar appears multiple times, as does Web of Science, and then also in a broad sense, journal articles and papers. Um, so these are all good places to find information. Google Scholar isn't necessarily as good as some other things, other places, but we'll talk more about that. Google Scholar does have its benefits, um, but. It's really cool that in this day and age, like we even have a Google Scholar and we have all these databases because they just used to be so much harder to get even these basic information. So there's seven libraries on campus. McCarty D is over here in the, where the Black Star is. And then right north of it is Marston. That's the science library. Library West, which is number one, has more of the humanities uh, collections. And then the Smathers Library has a lot of, that's the rare collections. So they have pop culture, they have books, they have um, a Judaica suite, which is really pretty, a map collection. So there's all these other resources on campus that, um, can really help you with your research. It's one of the joys, I think, of being in such a big school. Where number four is, that's the Fine Arts Library. And if you haven't been there, they have tree houses. Um, so that's a really cool one. Education is on the other side of 13th Street, number five. And then the Law Library is on the other, on the west side. And the Health Science Library is on the south side. And each of the libraries have their own unique flavors. So if you're looking for a place to study, um, it could be cool just to walk around and visit a few of the libraries. Maybe you'll find that you like the fifth floor of Marston because it's really quiet. Or maybe you wanna be in the tree houses and do work there. And so thinking about libraries as, a, as also as a place for you to study and a safe place. And the libraries are really trying very hard um, to maintain a safe uh, atmosphere for, for the UF community. So the UF catalog is called Primo. And here's a shortened link to Primo. Um, and I'm just going to go over this really quickly. So Primo uh, refers to the UF catalog, but it's also a system that the state of Florida bought. And there's over 40 other institutions in Florida that also use Primo. And that's really advantageous because um, 
if you search statewide, you're actually pulling all the references from that 40, um, from those other 40 institutions plus UF. Uh, and if you search everything, you're getting all the UF, all of UF's holdings and articles. And you can kind of see down here what just by searching sea turtle in Florida, that if you search everything, you get 19,000 results and then a few hundred in statewide and UF. Um, and I guess the other kind of takeaway point from this is that there's a lot of different resources available on these catalogs. If for some reason, if you find a book that UF doesn't have, maybe if you're on um, the state, uh, statewide um, query and you find something from FIU that you really want, you can submit a request for it. Or also, if you have an article that you really that you need for your research, um, you can put in a request for that. And the if it's through if it's something located in Florida, it's UBORO, and if it's something outside of Florida, it's interlibrary loan. But you can just put in a request, and um, will the librarians will there's a whole department that will help track down that resource for you. Uh, the thing, though, to keep in mind is that if you would like a book, so for a PDF of an article or a book chapter, they usually come pretty quickly, and then you can download it and keep it. Um, but if you would like a book or something that's much more, something physical, uh, the, the, the period you can have it is 30 days with a potential for 30 more days. So. If you want it, uh, request it, but then you know, try to get what you need from it as soon as possible. UF also has a lot of databases. When we think of holdings, we have um, both the physical things, but then also databases. And these databases are all online. These are collections of information that the library has paid sometimes a lot of has paid money for it and sometimes a lot of money for it. so it's really important to put these to work and um, they actually will do a lot of work for you and make your life as a grad student easier these databases there's over 1100 databases that uf subscribes to and some are more sciencey than others there's a list on the marston website that has sciencey ones and then that last link will take you to all the databases. But every database has slightly different information. And it's a way to compare information between, um, you can get a lot more information because they all focus on different things. There might be some overlap, but um, every database also has its own net data niche, so to speak. And so, if you do use the databases, I always recommend searching two or three. Two of the most popular databases are Web of Science and Scopus. These are very big databases that cover a lot of disciplines, hence the name multidisciplinary. Um, and they're pretty widely used. I saw Web of Science and uh, we saw Web of Science as one of the things that people wrote down. But Scopus is another really cool one that UF got a subscription to uh, less than a year ago. And it has um, a different concentration of information than Web of Science. They all really cover sciences and arts and humanities and other disciplines, but Web of Science is, is much more science focused. Um, and they, well, the science is also an older da database, so it covers information from 1900 to the present. But Scopus really is trying to work on getting a complete picture of information from 1970 to the present. And then that means if you're looking for what's happening in the world in general or the scientific world, then from those years, then Scopus would give you more power. 
Scopus also has more interdisciplinary research, which may be of interest to this department um, or this school rather. And both of them have built-in citation managers. Web of Science works well with EndNote and also Scopus works with Mendeley. Um, and they have lots of different ways to search the article data. They've made keywords, they've provided a lot of data linkage um, between the author and the keywords and the journal. And there's also a lot of metadata that you can look at if you wanted to get a, if you were doing like a big literature review. The last difference is that Web of Science, uh, sorry, Scopus tends to has more non-English sources. Another really cool journal is the Journal of Visualized Experiments. And this one is, as its name suggests, is videos. Um, so these are peer-reviewed publications that are in video format. Um, it's like a whole team of people will come and videograph you, videotape you, and then they'll edit it. And then like it goes through a peer-reviewed process. And what's really cool about this is that if you're stuck uh, or need some help with finding how to do a certain method or you need some quality uh, things to put in your classroom to teach about concepts, then Jove is a really good choice to, um, to that's a really good time to go to, that's a very good time to go to Jove and use what's there. UF also has an institutional repository, and this is a place to deposit data sets. Um, if you wanted it for publications, or if you have posters or presentations that you want to leave, that you want like a lasting record for, and maybe something that's more citable long term, then the IR is a good place to put that. And then within the IR are the UF digital collections. And these are newspapers, maps, photographs, the rare books. Like these are things, these are uh, other pieces of information that UF has that are not in Primo. So if you're looking for something kind of rare or also obscure, um, there might be something in the UF DC. If you're doing work in the Caribbean, uh, UF has gotten has a very large holding of Caribbean newspapers, and that could be really a cool place for information. They are work. It is a little bit tricky to search through the UFDC, but they are working on upgrades. And again, if you have any questions, I'm happy to walk you through it. So were there any questions about library resources? No. Yeah, let me see my microphone working. Um, so I just have a question about the Primo, which is like kind of new to me. And so I'm wondering like if you are like if I'm at home, right? And I've got my VPN, I'm signed in through the VPN, and then I'm like looking through Google Scholar or something, it'll give me access to everything that you have has you know a subscription to. Does it also work with the other institutions that are linked in with Primo, or do you have to go through the library website for that access? No, if you if you log in through VPN. Uh, at home, you should have access to the UF catalog to Primo for both UF and also statewide. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh. Hey, Sarah. Hi. Hi, Laurel. Um, I don't know. It's okay if you can't see me. Um, it's awesome. Like the amount of library resources are awesome. I, my frustration, and it could be, I say frustration with an asterisk, knowing that this could just be me not like really knowing how to use the tools well. I feel like the search, I have trouble finding things in the search function. Like my sort of what I'm doing, if I'm looking for a paper or researching a topic, like I will, my first sweep is to like go to Google Scholar. 
Um, and yes, recognizing that they don't have everything or sometimes if it's, um, you know, I can't get actually get access to it, I'll go to Primo and use their search function. Um, and I kind of just put some search terms in there or maybe an author in a year, the same way I would in Google Scholar. And it often seems to like not find the paper, even if I've given it, you know, like th I, the things that I know are in this, then it should find it. I, am I just do? Am I just bad at search terms? <laughs> um, gosh, I, you know, I, I, we know it's a pretty new system. They up, they took it. It's um, about a year old, and I, I've had. I think I've I've kind of run into those issues also, where it's a little bit hard to search for things. Um, so for an individual paper, I probably would use an advanced search and really try to put in as much information as you know about the paper. But if you wanted to look for things uh, more broadly, um, Primo is not really the best tool for like writing an introduction to a paper. It's, uh, you really wanna dive into the databases. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks, thanks, Laurel. You're welcome. So, the next section is library services and how the libraries can, other ways that the libraries can provide help with research. And these are things that are kind of made by librarians for people, or they're also kind of, tend, they're also really important, but less, and well, they're more emerging services that, that are needed for research. Okay, next Menti. How can libraries and librarians help with research? Okay, so some responses are coming in. I see track down book, identifying research keyword, and then a few others for finding resources and as a study place, um, and then also citation support. So yes, these are all different things that the libraries and uh, myself and other librarians do provide, but there's lots of other kind of services that um, librarians are constantly working on to help with um, research. So just to reiterate, like uh, as your liaison, I'm able to do these things. Um, and so in some ways I am a service to your department and uh, I'm just here to help. Um, and I know research having been a graduate student, um, that research can be really difficult. So uh, feel free to reach out anytime. Another thing that I can provide um, is a lib is what's called a lib guide, short for a library guide. And this is a resource that undergraduates and graduate students can go to to find information. Um, there's some, there's, it covers topics such as how do I come up with a research question? How do if uh, what do I do if I'm off campus? And there's um, but then there's also other things like suggestions for databases. The cool thing about LibGuides is that they're embeddable in Canvas, so you can make them available to the students. Um, and then I consider the LibGuide to be a living document, and I always want it to change to better suit uh, the School of Natural Resources and the environment's need. Um, so please send me suggestions. Um, I, I, really, I really would appreciate it. If you have a quick, a relatively quick question, um, perhaps you've been on the library website and seen this orange 
Ask Us tab, if you click on that, that will take you to Ask a Librarian. And Ask a Librarian is, um, it will connect you with other librarians at UF who can help you with your question. Um, and I know also in SNRE, there's a lot of disciplines. If, uh, as a, if, if there are other librarians that could help you more with humanities or social sciences, um, please feel free to reach out to them. They'd love to help you. There's a whole list of liaison librarians in, at the University of Florida. Another really cool thing that is emerging is the Academic Research Consulting and Services, also known as ARCS. ARCS is located in the Health Science Building, Science Library, and it, their goal is to really support the UF community, community with all of these skills that are emerging uh, because we have access to so much data. These can include artificial intelligence and doing things online, such as digital humanities, but in our environment where if we have so much information, there's other really important things to think about, such as copyright and fair use, data management. How is this data going to um, survive going into the future? Uh, and then also how do I analyze these data that I've collected? And then there are some about publishing and archiving. So and going into open access, uh, which I'll talk more about later. And then there's reproducibility, uh, which is really important as we've seen um, some very high profile people, scientists who have uh, fraudulent, have based their whole career off of fraudulent data. And that kind of leads also into research integrity. So these are all skills that um, if you continue in academia, I think will continue to be more important, but wherever you go, they're, they're also important. Um, the libraries also have some committees that might be of interest to you, such as the Open Access Committee. Um, the, and so open access is this idea that when we publish things as scientists, we want it to be available to everybody. But there's lots of costs involved um, with open access. You know, publishers have a pretty exorbitant fee for open access. Um, and so the libraries really try to minimize or to cut down on that, those expenses um, by negotiating, negotiating with these publishers to include open access as part of our uh, as, as part of um, as part of like UF's ability to get access to the databases, so like we pay for a database, and maybe get like ten percent off. Sorry, <laughs> uh, or a free. You know, you can publish for free. So there's a web guide for that also, and UF has agreements with Archive, MDPI, Cambridge Uni University Press, and many more. Um, and there's another committee that's really trying to lower costs for the UF community by searching for ways that um, books can be more affordable for students and to try to minimize like the, the prices for just to get an education. The libraries also have lots of really cool technology to check out. Every library is a little bit different. Uh, we have tape measures, GoPros, wildlife cameras, Arduinos, and if you ever in a pinch, uh, lots and lots of cords. <laughs> um, and so please feel free to check th out these tools. They're really, really cool. There's also scanners where you locate in all the libraries. And you can make, let's say you want a chapter from a book, you can go and scan the chapter. Um, and then afterwards, it'll, once the, this setup here, will put it into a format 
that you can search by keywords afterwards. So that's really cool. On the, when you walk into Marston, um, you're on the second floor. If you go down to the first floor, there's what's called the Marston Maker Space. And the Marston Maker Space has lots of really cool pieces of technology, 3D printers, scanners, sewing machines, um, lots of really big bulky pieces of technology. And you may think, oh, whatever, why would I want this? But uh, I've seen people 3D print out skulls and then they can take those skulls into the classroom, uh, these replicas, as opposed to the original more fragile skull. And so, I don't know, maybe you have to sew some pouches to put underground. Um, you can just go here and, and get, use the sewing machine. Although I think they're all broken at the moment, but <laughs> we're working on it. That was not a good sales pitch, but I'm being honest. Okay. Hey. So lastly, um, I would like to do a quick demo of features within Web of Science. But before that, I would just would love to know what's your favorite database? Web of Science. It's a good one. <laughs> JSTOR, that's, also, that's a good one. More humanities-based, but yeah. Scopus. Okay. Data Dryad. Not too familiar with that one. GBEF, okay, lots of genetic, lots of information there. SigShare. What does SigShare do? Well, somebody will have to write what SigShare does. I've not heard of that one. <laughs> okay. SigShare, you can put your database and your script like in R, your code for NAR, and then like people can download as a zip and run all of your analysis and see how you got the results. Okay. That's cool. Yeah. That's other one. Is it it's oh uh, what's the other big one where people put their scripts? Yeah, it's different than it so they're competitors. Okay. Okay. That's a really good reason to use a big share then. So, uh, yeah, these are all really good databases. And, um, but just to reiterate, like, there's a lot more at UF. Um, there's 1,100. Um, and so, if you need help finding one, please let me know. I'm happy to help. Um, I did not see Google Scholar there, um, but since Google Scholar has come up in the past before uh, on previous mentees, um, just a word, some words of warning about Google Scholar. Google Scholar doesn't do quality control. It just pulls all the information. And so as a result, you're more, much, much more likely to see both fraudulent papers and predatory journals. These are both, um, these are both different things that take advantage of students and um, are just really awful things. Um, the one advantage of Google Scholar is that if you're just looking for one individual article, it's usually pretty easy. Um, but databases also provide a lot of Databases that UF subscribes to or pays for also provide a lot of features that are uh, really important um, that will make your life easier. So there's the ability to keep track of searches and combine different searches. Um, there's much more ways to search and filter the data. Um, 
But, uh, oh, I should have said here, it's harder to find an individual article. Um, another advantage of using a database is that Web of Science and Scopus and these other databases, um, they're all in competition with each other. They all want you to use EndNote or uh, Mendeley. And so they make it really easy to, down, imp to download the references and import them into any database. But if you use Google Scholar, Google Scholar also has the, you know, like how sometimes there's, the titles are in all caps. <laughs> like, so then you have to go back and manually change that. So if you do it in a database, you won't run into that issue. So let's jump into some cool things about Web of Science. So here I am in Web of Science, um, and just check the time here. Okay, so first off, there's lots of different keywords and things that you can search for. Um, and then also within Web of Science, there's even different collections. The Web of Science core collection is pretty much covers all of them, but the biosis and the caddy, um, in the zoological records, those will all pull in different things. So when you're using a database, be aware of subcollections. Um, for searching, there's a few different features that are really cool. For example, I'm gonna use quotation marks and you can do this in Google Scholar also. But I can search for the phrase climate change, and I'm just going to search for that. Oh, climate, climate. Wow. <laughs> um, okay. You can see here we get 368,000 results. Um, but let's just say I also want to learn more about amphibians, I can go here and type in amphibian and then use uh, what's called a wild a truncation and add an asterisk at the end. And this will look for anything. It will look for amphibian and amphibians. And then I could also add, well, I also want frogs. And so I can search for those. Um, and then lastly, I'm just really, I only want to find things about Florida. So we can go back here to the search. And this is really cool. If you go to advanced search and scroll down, it saved all the searches here. So I could go to climate change, amphibian and frog, and Florida, um, and then combine the sets using the word and. And as you can see, there's 44 results. But if you wanted to find more th things broadly, you know, you could click on amphibians and Florida and then combine those and you get more hits. So um, using this, will give you a lot more power for your searches. And then if you have a, and, uh, sorry, a Web of Science account, you can save these searches and you can keep track of your searches. Because I know like as a grad student, I would be like, I'm gonna search this, I'm gonna search this. And then like a second later, I've forgotten. And so I, I search, have to search again. Um, so that's a really powerful tool. It's also really, let's just say we wanted to just see what, what's been published at University of Florida. We can click here, affiliation, and then I'll type in University of Florida. And there's 256,000 results. But I'm really just interested, um, I wanna sort them by, highest citation. So you can see here, 
that this paper from 2003 has been cited over 39,000 times. But the caveat with that is that these are site, Web of Science only puts things that are cited that are also in its database. So there's 39,144 more articles in Web of Science that have cited this paper. So the number is probably higher. But it gives you a lot of different ways to filter things. Maybe you want to say, ooh, what are the highly cited? Well, we just did that. But you know, what are like the hot papers? You can just refine that. And you get some things on COVID and other cool, probably, you know, things from the med school. Yes. What makes it a hot paper? I don't know. Let's find out. <laughs> I wish there was a little thing why it would be a hot paper. But it was, I was thinking it's like late night professor used to have the little chili pepper. Yeah. <laughs> Which they don't anymore, but maybe it's like that. <laughs> um, but then you can also like search by journal. You can search by authors. Uh, by years. So it gives you a lot of power to really try to find that information that you want. If you need it, if you would like to see um, information about the journal and trying to figure out, well, do I want to publish in this journal? Like how similar is it? How similar is my research to this journal? You can look at the impact factor on in this year in well, 2021, I guess they need to update it. Uh, but then five year, and then also there's a whole bunch of statistics about the journal that could be helpful if you're doing like a publication about journals. And then lastly, I know Google Scholar also does this, but let's say I want to find everything by this author here. I can click on the author and I can see that this person has published 302 publications. And so you can also click on profiles on Google Scholar, but that's what the information you get is contingent upon them putting in that information. And it might be a pain if you have a lot of different articles to do that. And so Web of Science like, does a lot of that hunting and making connections between the data for you. So those were the things I wanted to show you um, in Web of Science and just encourage you. I know like Google Scholar is pretty easy, but these databases will get just give you so much more power to um, really make your research more, to make your research easier. And then lastly, I guess we have a few minutes left, but like what aspects of the research Method and libraries, would you like to learn more about? And this is also like a time for questions. So thank you very much. Why is this please down here? Oh, I don't know what that is. <laughs> You don't know what you don't know. I, that's a very true statement. And sometimes in a place like UF, it's really hard to actually even know, to, to, to know, well, it's impossible to know everything at UF, but, and it's really easy to not know, to not know a lot of things because it is so big and there are so many resources. But I tend to think about UF as like this way that, um, that it's so big, you can usually find somebody studying it. Uh, you just have to ask and find it. So identity-based resources, um, like what? There are some lib guides for the identity for databases and other information for, yeah, based on identity. Um, so I guess, was that academic or just like, 
That's me. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> so um, just like more broadly identity-based resources, but additionally, like accessibility of resources. Mm -hmm. So like if I'm given a paper in class that's not colorblind friendly, do I have the option of going to the library to find a more colorblind friendly version of that paper? Or could someone help me track down a version of the paper that might be more colorblind friendly? That's just an example, something yeah. I'm thinking about. So uh gosh i've never actually heard of that but i i know the library really the library does have an accessibility committee um so that would be one place i would try i also would reach out to a colleague who i know has um colorblindness okay. yeah so i think there are ways hopefully there would be a program at some point where you could just stick in a figure and it would just like you know change the colors for you yeah that would be Fine. Yes. <laughs> so curious about how impact factors are calculated. Um, so I don't know very much about that, but I can get back to you. Um, it seems like a kind of voodoo and kind of magical. I see Allison nodding her head. So I'll get back to you, but in some ways, like it doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, because it's just another power structure within academia. So what citation manager um, is best? And the answer is it's whichever one you like the most. And again, you gotta go back to the scientific method. You gotta try them. Like there's Zotero, there's Mendeley, EndNote, SciWheel. Um, you gotta think about like what it is that you want. There's some, there's a libguide uh, for the different citation managers, but it's uh, important to think about like what um, will it carry on with me after UF? Um, what features do I need? They all try to do, they're all competing against each other. So they're all doing the same, mostly the same thing, but you know, where you click buttons and things might make a difference. Um, and then also a big thing would be sharing. If you're working in size limit of PDFs, like if you get Zotero, you have less space. But I think it's like, since it's EndNote and Mendeley, like they just have so much space, it's unlimited. I, I think you can put a lot more articles. So it depends if you want to store PDFs and then also share them with collaborators. How many departments have their own librarian? Um, pretty much every department. <laughs> Yeah, we really try to cover them all. Uh, funding for open access fees. Um, so unfortunately, that's something that there used to be a fund from the provost, but it's on indefinite hiatus. Um, so really, I think, and this question came up to me last week, also, and I'm not sure there really is much funding within UF to defray these costs. The best advice I can give is that when you're working on a grant, um, I know it may be difficult, but to try to fact try to factor that into your budget. And I think going forward, that's a really good practice. Um, but it never hurts to send the open access committee an email, and maybe they have more information for you. Um, and they might be able to say, oh, well, we have this, so it's, you know, less money. <laughs> and then lastly, online books. Yeah, so if you would like an online book, all you've got to do is go onto Primo. And if we have copy an online book, then you should have access. The caveat is that when we buy these books, sometimes, the access is different for the book because the publishers want to make more money if one person reads it, two people read it, or three, or unlimited. So if somebody else is reading that book, it won't be available. So you would have to try back again later. So yeah, did I miss anything on chat or? Okay. Okay. Right.
So yes, thank you all very much. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm happy to stick around for a little bit and uh, feel free to reach out anytime. I'm uh, both uh, liaison and I also consider myself in some ways a cheerleader because you know I just want everybody to do the best they can. And so thank you. Thank you so much. Hang up on the folks on Zoom. All right. Um, so for folks on Zoom, if you have any questions for me um, or any issues, uh, let me know. Otherwise, thank you so much for logging on and we will see you next Monday. Um, and I'm going to stop sharing and end there.